Well, again, this weekend, we are going to continue in a, a series we call Imagine. We kicked this off a few weeks ago, and I love the challenge that Pastor Kevin issued last weekend. He really inspired us and encouraged us to see our life as a part of God's plan versus trying to fit God into our plan. And if you'll remember, he laid out four things that we kind of built a framework for understanding how we can be a part and really know what God's plan is. And the first one is real simple. Know God. Find freedom. Discover your purpose. And then make a difference. And every week we talk about this and those four things are actually what's a part of our growth track. Have you heard Pastor Jonathan talk about growth track a bit earlier in our services or in Bellevue, wherever you're at? We talked about growth track, and one of the cool things about growth track is it really is a pathway for those four things, and we do this every single month, and it's a really great way for you to really understand and know what your part is in God's plan. So. I would highly encourage you, not just because I go to church here, and not just because it's a thing we do, it is really helpful, and it will really encourage you. So if you've been at, maybe you're new, or maybe you've been at Champion Center for an eternity, Growth Track is for all of us, and if you haven't been through it yet, take some time and find out what it's all about. But I'm going to get into this weekend, we're going to continue on this same theme, talking about this whole idea of imagining. But this weekend, I want you to imagine your current circumstances really is an opportunity for God to do something greater in your life. Right where you are, right now, whether it's awesome or whether you have a lot of challenges, I would like for all of us this weekend to imagine what our current, like take your own life right now and imagine, here's the scenarios that are playing out, here are the challenges I'm facing, here is the real and the raw of my current reality. And I want you to imagine with us this weekend, God using that for something greater in your life. We're going to open up with a scripture out of Mark 10, if you would turn your Bibles there, your version digital Bible, or it's going to be on the screen. Jesus looked at them and he said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. We're going to back up one chapter to Mark 9.23. Again, Jesus is saying, all things are possible for one or those who believe. And I want to propose that at the root of our belief, it requires great imagination. For us to really believe, to imagine our current circumstances as the right opportunity that God can actually do something greater in our life starting right where we're at. The thing I love about Jesus in these passages is that he's saying to all of us, guys, don't conclude your life the way it is right now. Take a snapshot. Know where you're at. But don't make this the final conclusion of what I can do in your life. Don't accept what's going on right now as the final, the say-all, the be-all. All things are possible for those that believe. We've got to engage him. I love Jesus because he always engages with us right where we're, are, right where we're at. He doesn't like fast forward seven years and be like, it's a fantasy that we're like, I don't really, what are you talking about, Jesus? And then he gives us some random miracle that doesn't apply. He's like, no, what's going on in your life right now? Do you believe it's possible that this can turn around? Every single time, I mean, when you read through, Jesus was right in every circumstance, and that's how he is today. He's right in the middle of our circumstances. God invites us to this table of imagination. One thing that's cool about God, a lot of people, you know, they're like, well, how does this play out when I come to believing in Him? And the idea is that, you know, God is the one who brings us salvation. God is the one who brings us eternal life. Without our belief and our imagination that He's the one that does that, that's kind of the, the framework that He engages us with. But 
make no mistake, we do nothing to earn that. We don't earn our way to God. We, we can't make that decision. He's the one that makes that decision to save us, to rescue us. But he engages our imagination. And he said, do you believe? Do you believe it's possible? Can you actually imagine God using your current circumstance for something greater in your life? So we're going to lay out just a few things today. We may get through all of them. We may not. But one of the things I want to start with, if you're going to imagine your present circumstances as the, the groundwork for something greater in your life, we've got to imagine our tests in life as an opportunity to trust God. Now, tests come in form of headaches. Not literal headaches, maybe literal headaches, but the challenges in life that we don't always see coming. It's like you wake up one day, things are going good, and the car breaks down. You're like, what? You show up at work, you find out someone's been hating on you. You go to school, you realize someone didn't like, I don't know, your clothes or your hair or your backpack or X, Y, Z. Something went wrong on the sports team. Something went wrong in your business. Kids are going crazy, which if they're under, you know, I don't know, if they're just kids in general, they like to do that from time to time. But these are the things in life. These are the trials that we all walk through. And my encouragement is that we would imagine these trials as an opportunity to trust God, to see him as a proving ground. We stop short. Oftentimes we just get mad and we get angry and it ruins our day and then we're like, it's over. But could it be that God wants to use these to shape our character? Could it be an opportunity for us to say, you know what? I don't want this. I didn't invite this into my life. But I am going to see and trust God through this process. And I know he's going to work out something better at the end of this. Abraham was great in the Bible. Father Abraham, if you read about him, some of you know this story, some of it might be new to some of you, but he's like the father of our faith, and yet he had these opportunities to trust God. These trials, these challenges he would walk through. And one of the times God was like, hey, Abraham, by the way, I'm gonna birth like nations through you, and like my whole kingdom is gonna come from your lineage. And Abraham was like, that's awesome. I'm old, God. And my wife is barren. How's this going to work? What are you talking about? I'm going to be the father of many nations. And yet, he believes God. He goes with God. And in the progression of Abraham's life, he does this many times over. And you know one of the cool things about Abraham is God credited his righteousness based on his belief, his imagination. Later, when God asked Abraham to offer his son Isaac on the altar, You'll remember Abraham struggling, but you know what? He had a track record with God. He's like, no, I'm going to use, I imagine God is going to do something good. Now, God was just testing his heart. He didn't actually have him sacrifice his son. He made a way. But the point was, is that Abraham, every time he would get into these trials, these challenges, and he would use it as an opportunity to trust God. For us this weekend, those headaches in your life, could it be that right now some of the headaches we're facing could just be a great opportunity for us to put our trust and our faith in God? But how about we imagine our setbacks as a comeback? I imagine oftentimes many of the setbacks that we face, not all of them, but many of the setbacks that we face are our own doing. It's like, God didn't do it. I don't believe God just brings hardship on anyone. But a lot of times we make our own mess, right? We make a bad decision. Or we've, you know, whatever. We blew it. And yet those setbacks, God wants to use as a comeback in our life. Can you actually imagine that? Because most of us, when we blow it, we're so full of our own shame or guilt or upset that we're thinking, man, how, I don't, first of all, I don't deserve to have a comeback. Secondly, I don't, like, is it even possible? 
how is this even possible? My situation is so horrible. I've seen families walk through, you know, just horrible things. We've seen divorce. We've seen businesses blow up. We've seen all kinds of events caused by our own failures. I love that we had a young lady share her story today. She was so vulnerable to share some of the setbacks in her life. But how encouraging is that to all of us when we hear her story and we think, wow, God can do it for her. Why wouldn't he do it for me? Why wouldn't he do it for any of us? Our setbacks can actually be a comeback if we'll imagine. And I love, you know, Joseph, if you've ever studied Joseph in Scripture, and if you haven't, I really encourage you to just Google the guy, open up Scripture on Joseph. This is an unbelievable guy who honestly went through scenarios that he didn't deserve and he didn't create. And yet he maintained this faith and this imagination that God was going to bring a comeback in his life. His own family, he comes from a good family. He had older brothers. He was the youngest. They got jealous of him. And they literally sold the, the kid into slavery. Can you imagine your family and your brothers taking you, looking you in the eye and selling you off? And he spent the next many, many years in slavery and then went through other hardships through other seasons in jail and working for different people and was wronged by other and more people. And yet his resilience, his imagination to imagine God bringing a comeback in his life carried Joseph to the point that I don't, I don't, I don't do the math on the years, but it's many, many years later. He was positioned basically right under Pharaoh as the most powerful man in the nation at that time. And God used him Basically to be the savior when there was famine and drought, all of Egypt, which Egypt at that time was like the great power. And all, like all nations, his own family had to come to him begging for food. The same people that sold him into slavery. But Joseph, like how did he maintain this idea of a comeback year after year, setback after setback, being wronged after being wronged after being wronged? What was it? It was his imagination. He imagined, he believed that God was going to come through for him yet again. I was reading recently uh, an article on neuroplasticity. Now, if you've heard about this, neuroplasticity is this whole idea in the scientific community that our brains are not fixed. And we used to think that once we you know, became an adult, that our brain kind of solidified, hardened, and didn't change. But scientific research for the last several years now, a lot of scientific journals have written about this, a lot of studies have been conducted on the ability for the human brain to adapt and to change based on our environment, the thoughts that we think, what we focus on, the energy, the things we physically do, the environments we engage in, literally, physically changes our brain. And our brain is adaptable. So I actually, I'm going to read an excerpt really quick out of an article that's referring to a lot of these scientific journals and the studies written about neuroplasticity. And the author says, what you focus on is powerful. The brain will build around what it rests upon. Whether we view the world through a lens that is sad or happy, optimistic or hopeless, what you pay attention to will shape your brain which in turn will shape your experiences, your relationships, and your life. Now to me, all this is doing is just reaffirming what we know to be true in Scripture. But I know a lot of minds need to hear, I need the, I need the evidence, man. Show me a study that says that's true. Well, all of research now, like when, when you study the brain, it's, it's proving it. Right now, we have a lot of couples in the life of our church who are going through something called Financial Peace University. Give a shout out if you're a part of that. Ow! We have like, I think it's like almost 700 people uh, in our church right now. So we have like, I don't know, between 5 and 10% of our church going through Financial Peace University. So cool. And what's really cool, though, is that as a part of this process of imagining something greater, a lot of times, you know, when you come through something like Financial Peace University, you know, people are wanting to sharpen and learn and grow in their area of 
understanding finances and how to manage it God's way for God's glory. And the whole idea in this class is it's actually designed in the curriculum. We take a snapshot in week two, and it's designed, it's anonymous, but we take a snapshot as a class of where we're at as a snapshot of, okay, this is our reality, this is our current state, and this is our starting point. If we're going to imagine something greater happening, we've got to know right where we're at. So I wanted to share just a bit. We added all the numbers from all the classes together uh, of the families that are just in our church going through this right now. Listen to this. Of those, of those uh, people that are going through, there's roughly 362 households. We haven't qu counted quite all of them, but we're pretty close. 362 households represented in non-mortgage debt, so not including mortgages, there is a cumulative $15,722,000 in debt. 362 families. Cash in hand, liquid cash, just under $4 million between those same families. Not necessarily a great ratio. And a 1,300 in 65 credit cards opened. Now that's just a fraction of our church. As you remember, we shared this stat. This is really a picture of America. And you could broad, I mean, you literally, there's data on over five million families now, and, and this, this is a snapshot in the church, out of the church, it doesn't really matter. But when we look at snapshots like this, we're like, oh, that's depressing. I don't wanna, don't tell me that stat. But what's cool is, we are a mat, okay, we're like, hey, this is it. It's where we're at. It's all right. This is our current reality. But God can do something amazing if you'll begin to take your current reality and imagine there is something greater in store for us. We're going to gain new wisdom. We're going to gain new understanding. We're going to create new patterns and habits. And it's going to dramatically change the landscape of our family the people we interact with, our church, and our country. Dramatically. Imagine the difference if we engage this way with every setback that we have in our life. We'll just say, you know what? This is my reality. This is what I'm facing in my life. Whether you created it or it was created by someone else. And imagine, can God actually create a comeback out of this? I hope you would allow your heart to be opened again. I hope you would allow faith to build. Belief, imagination, at its very root nature. That you would allow God to stir your heart again. Because it is possible when you believe. Jesus said all things are possible when you believe. All right. Now imagine your blessing as an opportunity to be a blessing. Imagine that day when your breakthrough comes, that it's not just a setup for us and ourselves, but it's really a setup because of what God wants to do through us. The many other people he wants to help on the other side of us getting out of our mess. When people like Kelsey share her story, you know what's cool is God wants to bless and help her life and her family. But you know, beyond that, he wants other people to hear about her story, to hear that it's possible. It's possible that other people can come out of their stuff. God wants us to use our blessing to be a blessing to other people. My challenge, though, is don't just stay at, like, don't just think finances right now. That's a great thing because our finances are one of the greatest things we can use to do anything we want. We can use it for good. We can use it for bad. We can do whatever we want with it. But think of your every ordinary day. Like, what is a blessing in your life? Are you good at smiling? Well, smile at everyone you can. If you're a natural encourager, encourage. Use the blessing. Use those gifts in your life. If you have an ability to teach, teach. If you have the ability to show people how to raise kids that are amazing, Share that knowledge. Be a part of our kids' ministry. I mean, love on some people. I'm pumped for all the people that actually can sing and use their blessing to bless us. And not the people that can't sing. 
Thank you. Pastor Jonathan, if you guys didn't see him here at our Tacoma campus, he was like singing at the break and we were all like, ah. No, actually it sounded pretty good. I don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make you feel bad, but the point is use your blessing to be a blessing, okay? In Genesis 12, two, it's a great scripture written to Father Abraham and it says, and I will make you a great nation. God's talking to Abraham. I'll make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that, Abraham, you will be a blessing. You know that's our heritage? If you're in God's kingdom, our father, Father Abraham, that's our heritage. God wants to bless us. It's spiritual blessing. It's physical blessing. It's blessing from A to Z. All across the board, God wants to use every possible inch of blessing that comes into our life to bless other people. But that means that we've got to take a snapshot of where we're at. and We have to imagine God actually using the setbacks in our life and the things in our life that we're not always proud of or the things that we didn't ask for. God, there is really something you want to do through this scenario, this situation. We've got to believe again. We've got to imagine God engaging with us. Okay, let's imagine now starting what we've been putting off. <laughs> Anybody have something you've just been putting off? You're like, I know I need to start that. I need to start that business. We've already talked about it in our family. I need to start. I know I need to start being a part of a champion life group. Man, I know I've been talking about my new reading plan in the Bible and I'm going to start it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start that new exercise program because I bought the elliptical machine, I got the ab cruncher, and I'm going to start it. How about that new diet that you promised yourself you were going to start? Like, no, 2017, the beginning of the year, I'm doing the new diet. It's going to happen. It's happening. What are those things that God's calling you to start? Maybe it's engaging in the life of the church. Maybe you've been way too cautious. We've got to start. Imagine starting. Use your imagination. Use the picture and the power of your mind, what your brain thinks about. Use that to your advantage. We all have an opportunity to use our imagination however we please. And the question is, are you using it to your advantage? Or is it running you down a dark, dreary road? Because we can all go there. Okay, imagine finishing now. So we're starting, imagine starting things, okay? But now imagine finishing those things that we started somewhere back there. Well, we did start the new program or the diet or the Bible study or, 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 or. Perhaps you're here this weekend and you started with God. Oh, maybe it was a while back. Maybe it was when you were a teenager. Maybe when you were a kid. Maybe, I don't know, maybe last year. And just honestly, you got away. Whether it's intentionally, whether it was not intentional, busyness, distraction, setbacks of life, disappointments, discouragement. What are those things that are holding you back? Imagine with me now, like, make it real. Make it your own life. What are those things that I've started that I know I need, to, I need to follow through on? I need to finish. Maybe you started a family and you haven't been there for your family. Finish that. Be there. Determine. I'm going to be there. My kids are going to have parents. Good parents, not perfect parents. I'm going to be there. Maybe there's scenarios in your, you know, in your career you started down the road of imagining and dreaming and you've just sunken into settling. You've you're just kind of gone through the motions. Pick it back up again. Start again. Imagine that God is with you. I love this story. Uh, we did something this summer called At the Movies. Every summer we do this really fun thing, At the Movies. If you were here, you'll remember this. But just to catch anyone up who wasn't here with us, our last movie was called Eddie the Eagle. 
Now, I hadn't even seen, I didn't even know anything about this movie until we did at the movies. It was an awesome movie. The guy, the main character, his name was Eddie the Eagle, after the title. And his coach was named Perry. Okay, now, Perry was formerly an incredibly talented ski jumper. This movie's about ski jumping, and it's a true story based on Eddie the Eagle. But his coach, Perry, was basically now a washed-up, has-been, who could have been amazing type champion guy who's training him, okay? Now, Perry also had a coach back in the day, and his coach wrote a book, and he wrote about Perry. And so in the movie, there's this scene where Coach Perry now, who's coaching Eddie the Eagle, picks up his coach's, his former coach's book, and reads an excerpt that his coach wrote about him. And he said this, and this is what it reads. Perry was the most naturally gifted ski jumper I had ever trained. And he's also my biggest disappointment. He should have been my greatest champion, but his focus was not always on the mountain. Man, what a parallel. Has anyone gotten their eye off of your mountain? Have you gotten your eye off of your mountain that God's called you to? I love what he goes on to say. He said he never really understood, he's talking about Perry. Perry never understood that a true Olympian, a true champion, was not just about a God-given skill set. It's about never giving up. No matter what. Knowing that doing your best is the only option, even if it results in failure. That is the heart of a true champion. When I feel a lot of times when we face our setbacks, when we start trying to imagine, we quickly forget that God has something so much greater in store, and then we get our eye off of the mountain We get our eye off of the target. We think, well, I don't have the natural skill set that these amazing people that I follow on Instagram or Facebook or, you know, I I watch my favorite whoever's on TV or wherever you watch them. So there's no way that I'm ever going to obtain this championship life. At the end of the day, God has called each and every one of us to be an overcomer, to be a champion. It's about not giving up on what he's put in your hand to do. I often think of Apostle Paul, who right up to the end of his life, you know, the great Apostle Paul, the guy had a killer imagination. He would often write and talk about running his race to win. So Paul, in his writings, paints a picture for us. But I imagine Paul's imagination as a guy, like he saw himself as a runner in this marathon race of life. That was the visual that Paul used. Maybe it'll help you, like, okay, here I am in my race in life. It's like we shut our eyes and we see ourselves. Maybe we're in the first lap of 700 laps. Maybe you're in lap 37. Wherever you're at, you know, sometimes what we do is we kind of like drop our hands and we stop running and then we go and sit on the bench. We still got like 700 laps to go. The marathon, but Paul said, Man, I run my race to win. I press on toward the mark that God is calling me to, the high calling which Christ has put in me. We all have our own race. We've got to create the imaginations to go with it. You've got to imagine ourselves finishing strong and finishing well. Paul, all the way up to his death, was like, listen, I've been bruised, I've been beaten. I've had all kinds of stuff done to me unfairly, but I press on toward the mark that God has set before me. I'm not quitting, I'm not giving up. No setback is gonna keep me from moving forward. And that's what God calls all of us to this weekend. It's what he's calling you to this weekend. It's what he's calling me to this weekend. I love one of, one of the scriptures I use for my imagination, and it's just one piece. But in Philippians 1.6, It says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion to the day of Jesus. I often remind myself, not Ryan, God started something in you long ago. He's going to be faithful to complete it. But you can't quit. You can't give up. I can't turn it in. I'm not going to drop in. I'm not going to 
Say, ah, oh, I can't take this anymore. It's too much. It's too heavy. My setbacks are too large. God can do anything. Do you believe? All things are possible. Jesus said, all things are possible. But do you believe? I can't believe for you. God can't believe for you. You have to believe. You have to imagine. It's one of the coolest choices God gives us is the power to use our imagination. We can imagine the great, we can imagine the comeback, or we can live in our failure. And I would just encourage you, don't let moments of discouragement take over your imagination because what will happen is that discouragement will capture your imagination followed by imagining more discouragement followed by imagining more discouragement which leads to depression. And the flip side, the inverse is true. When you imagine the possibilities, even in the middle of your setbacks, imagine God working something good. Imagine doors opening. Imagine a shift in your family, in your heart, in your attitude. Use those imaginations. You'll go down a completely different path. I'm, I'm tired of the day where we all use circumstances to explain why people end up where they are. Certainly we all know circumstances of life are tough, but I have not met a human that doesn't walk through hard stuff in life. We all walk through it differently, but it affects us all the same in terms of discouragement. And the point of this story is we've all seen people who've grown up in great scenarios and end up in the ditch. We've all seen people who've grown up in great scenarios and end up doing great things. And, and we've also seen people grow up in horrible stuff who end up doing great things. And people who grow up in horrible stuff and end up doing horrible things. So it's not just about what we're handed in life. Certainly, all of us face different challenges. But what God is trying to say to us, and a lot of times when he was talking to people in Scripture, they did not come from the best scenarios all the time. And sometimes they did, like Joseph comes from a killer family and yet has to face years of discouragement to see this comeback in his life. And wherever you're at this weekend, man, I just hope that you won't allow your own current scenario to, to like give you the permission to disqualify yourself. Don't, don't be like, well, yeah, you just don't know how deep my current, yeah, my circumstances are so jacked up. If you got in this thing, you would agree with me and you would tell me, hey, just wallow in your pity for a little bit longer and spin out. No, I wouldn't. Because I've seen God do amazing things for people that are unthinkable, and he's still doing that today. He's going to continue to do that. But we have the choice in this matter. We have the choice. And that's what a lot of people, <laughs> when you get into religion, which I believe a relationship with Jesus is really not religion. People call it that. But they think it's just the way things are and forget to realize that God and his sovereignty chose to give you and I choice of what we think about. We don't, we don't have to think a certain way. He didn't create us to be robotic. But yet he knows everything from the end of the beginning and still in his sovereignty has managed a way in his master algorithm to understand how to give you and I the power to use our own imagination and to believe with him. Not about earning our salvation. Earlier when I opened up in Mark 10, this was a story of the rich young ruler. I purposely didn't say that. But this is a, this is a story that Jesus is, you know, he's basically answering his disciples. And they're saying, Jesus, what's the deal with this, this rich guy? So for those of you that aren't familiar with the story, the rich young ruler is this really wealthy guy in the Bible. It's a story told and Jesus kind of responds to his disciples in this scenario. The rich young guy comes up to Jesus and says, hey, how can I inherit eternal life? I've, I've obeyed all the commands since I was a kid. I've done everything I need to do. I'm basically saying I've dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's. I'm a good citizen. I love my family. I respect my elders. And Jesus said, you still lack one thing, man. Sell everything you have. Come follow me. And those of us that know the story know that the rich young man got really depressed and discouraged, and he walked away. Didn't do it. 
So the disciples were following up with him, and they're, they're like, hey, well, what's the deal with the rich guy in eternal life? How, like, explain this to us. And Jesus is saying, basically, the moral of this story wasn't just about possessions and wealth. He was saying, this guy's thinking he can buy his way to heaven. Like, like can, I earn my, can I perform my way there? Can I do a jig and a dance and make sure I do the things just right, and then I'll get in? Our culture is so, like, it permeates with that. Like, if we do enough good deeds, if, if, we, if we do enough community service, if we this, this, and that, then, well, we'll hopefully we're going to make it to heaven. I'm, I'm a good citizen. I, universal truth. You know, I, I live to the universal good nature of humankind. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's not what gets us to heaven with Jesus. It's just believing in him, that he's the one that made a way. I didn't make my way. Jesus made the way for me and for you. And then the cool part is when we come to that realization and we just say, all right, God, I accept you. Then he throws over to us and he's like, all right, cool. Now come on this journey of imagination with me because it's going to take one heck of an imagination if you want to capture everything I've got in store for you. I've got some good stuff for you, but you've got to come with me. So I just want to encourage you, God never brings our setbacks the ones, the, 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 the ones that we blow up, the ones that we screw up, but every single time he wants to use our setback and your setback for a comeback. Every single time he wants to use our setback for a comeback.